You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, before entering into a discussion of the word field, Father Paul takes a question from Richard regarding the Spirit of God in Scripture. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. So, Father, in thinking about the way that the Spirit moves against a community and against a church, it made me think in Acts often when Paul moves, it's the Spirit that moves him, the Spirit that directs him. Is it more useful for us to think of Paul as the object of the wind moving, or actually the community that Paul is blown into? Is the Spirit moving Paul, or is the Spirit yeah. moving Paul against a community? It's moving to establish the community by the Spirit of God. But this same Spirit is threatening, you know, it is linked to the crisis, krino. That's why in 1 Corinthians he says, use your judgment in the sense of anachrisis, discernment, actually uses another verb which is technically discernment, dokimazo, in order not to be katakrinin, judgment. The Spirit is the Spirit of God, period. The Spirit of God is the instrument through which God, who by definition is the judge, judges. But judgment, and you know this as a parent, like when you scold your child, to warn your child that that child made a mistake and thus make sure not to repeat it. And it could function as a quote-unquote negative judgment. Well, this time, I told you three times, you kept repeating, hand me the keys of the car. You're not allowed to drive for one week. So it's a question of functionality, and this is what we dislike. You know, we want to have the ultimate answer. And let me go on an aside now, which is very important. We assume that we can fathom the final judgment of God, as the born again do, and the Orthodox are born again also. Somehow, may the deceased rest in peace and arise in glory. But you don't know if that person is going to arise in glory or not. That person is going to arise to submit to the judgment, as Paul says in 150. Otherwise, you are uh, submitting to the famous apocadastasis of Origen and of his disciple, the Gregory the theologian, that somehow there is no hell, we are going all to be saved. Well, I don't see this in scripture. I see it in theology. But I don't see the scripture. And that is very important. So, I would say that the spirit functions through the apostle. He alone has the spirit. That he conveys through his teaching so that the people correct their behavior born 
out of this. You know, the spirit is something that moves something else. It doesn't have an entity in itself. The eternal third person of the eternal trinity. It's vain talk. The sound of the original in both languages, Greek and Hebrew, reflects that we have a movement, something that moves, which moves something else. That is what we should keep in mind. But it moves you to, as we heard in Romans, to action. So you, the recipient of the Spirit, whose giver is the Apostle in the name of God. You don't receive the Spirit from God. This is what mystics like to do. This way they put their scripture, they leave it in the monastery. They have become so perfect that they don't need to go to communion and go to church. And They know it all. They are in total communion with God. They practice theosis every day. That's a production of egocentric theology. Okay, let me repeat. It is the Spirit of God that is granted to the Apostle so that how is it granted? Through the teaching, obviously. And then the Apostle does the same with the rest. I hope my answer to your question was satisfactory. Again, the difficulty is that the people, the spirit and the final judgment uh, with the crisis and so on, it's always tricky in theology because theology controls it. Imagine the discussion among especially Orthodox theologians, how is life going to be in the kingdom? And remember, my nasty comment all the time. Well, first, my friend, you have to get there. And when you get there, you don't need me to tell you how it is. You'll be sending me electronic texts to tell me how it is. And that's the trouble. We want to control. That's why the final judgment should be dismissed from all books of theology, followed by the description of the kingdom. You have, before that, in the previous chapters, make sure that the people understand that you do not control the spirit. You have another text which is very powerful. And the spirit is the Lord. The Spirit acts lordly. This is again in Corinthians chapter 3. You could see how this letter to the Corinthians, as I tried in my commentary, which I believe is unique, there is no other commentary that deals with one Corinthians the way I do. The things are interconnected. And one of my major points in this book is that because the Corinthians, at least as reflected in the epistle, that they are already filled with the spirit and the wisdom of God, and they are living already in the kingdom, which the Orthodox like, that sound to speak. On purpose, Paul postpones the discussion of the resurrection until chapter 15. This is intention. And what proves to me that it is intentional, and when I point this to people, they systematically tell me, oh, wow, I never noticed that. Namely, that in chapter 11, Paul says, against the orthodox understanding of the liturgy, that every time you eat and drink, you remember the death of Christ. There is no mention of the resurrection. Okay? Since we have time, let me go to that text. I don't have it 
front of me, but I'll find it. That's why in chapter 11, it tells you to watch out. You better start correcting your misbehavior before the Lord comes. But the Lord is not going to come in chapter 12, nor in chapter 13, nor in chapter 14. He's going to come in chapter 15 as literature. So here you go. Osakis gar ean estite ton arton tuton ketopotirion pinete. You have the two elements as the Orthodox refer to them the bread and the wine. Ton thanaton tu kiriu katangellete achri u elsi. The death of the Lord you proclaim until he comes. That's strikingly non if not anti-orthodox that's why in my classroom i refer to the corinthians as the proto-orthodox they want to jump directly to chapter 15 and i believe literature is literature on purpose well let me flip the pages and get to chapter 15. only theologians do that You hear about the resurrection early on that Jesus was raised. But then the detail of the resurrection preceding the judgment is postponed until 15. And that for me is very important. It parallels the book of Revelation and so on. It parallels Leviticus and Deuteronomy where the two parallel chapters about the blessing and the curse are at the end of the book and so on. And so on. Just to elaborate a little bit on this major issue you brought up okay in my book i discuss the issue of field which in hebrew is sade just for the hearing sade so if i mention it now and then and i begin my discussion by saying why would the authors bother with the third term sade that parallels in meaning eris which is earth and Adama ground. Let's say you in English, you're speaking, everybody would understand that it's the same thing, field, earth, and ground. The most plausible answer lies in the difference of connotation and thus functionality, as I keep saying again and again. You heard enough from me about Eris and Adama. Let's go for this study. The biblical text itself makes a connection between these words. It's not that the connection is not there. On the one hand, Eris would be the generic term as opposed to heavens as well as to waters, and thus as a dry and solid surface where humans and land animals can live. And you have this already in Genesis 1. That would be the Eris. And in my book, I mentioned that Ard, from which we have another noun in Arabic formed on the basis of Ardiya, what is below you, the foundation on which you sit. And I apologize to my hearers, but some of them live in the Middle East and know that. In spoken Arabic, we use that word ardiye to refer to the pot that is used to train little kids to go to the bathroom. There you go. So, if you grew up in the Middle East, you have this connotation already in your ear. Arms, that's on which you stand. Okay? So, that would be the understanding of Eris as reflected in Genesis 1. On the other hand, Adam, you all know by now, it is the same root as Adam, the red, the color of the earth from which Adam is made and thus the color of the skin. Okay, in 
literary Arabic, we have uh, this connection about the skin, and you have it also in the text I'm going to read to you, just to invite you to realize you cannot go to a dictionary and or a book of theology and learn what Adama is. You can't. You can't. Richard reminds us of his professor, whom I quoted in the book, by the way, Richard, but I didn't mention your name. I said, the professor of a former student of mine, very important. Richard volunteered to give me an answer by saying, well, I checked with all the dictionaries and so on, they say so. And the professor tells me, and how do you know that they are correct? That's the thing. It's by hearing the text you will notice that it is connected with Adam, yellowish red, and it is linked to the Afar, which is the dust of the Adama. Early on in Genesis 2, we hear that man was formed out of the dust of the Adama to prepare for the God's punishment that he will return to dust. But when he says about the animals, he says they were formed out of the Adama. He doesn't mention dust. So here someone can make a theory. So the animals are superior to the human. That's not scripture. The functionality is within the story. And here again, I hope that someday you, because you refer to functionality in your podcast, to make sure that your hearers do not understand that functionality is the way things function in your presentation. It is how they function within the story and its movement. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network. 